I had a chat with a couple of different coaches yesterday. So I, I asked Peter Vermees this and I, I asked Greg Vanny this as well. What is your day-to-day routine like right now in the bubble? What's an average day like for you from when you get up to when you go to bed? Um, we train at night. So we, let's say training in average is around nine, nine o'clock. Um, so because of that, I tend to go to bed really late. Um, it's not normal. Uh, back in Vancouver, I wake up around 6 a.m. and go to bed around 9.30 p.m. Uh, that's my, my life in Vancouver. I get up early and go to bed early. Here it's been the opposite. I wake up a little bit later, like maybe around 10 o'clock, but also going to bed around 1, 2 a.m. Uh, and that is, uh, that is the change for me. Uh, we always have things to do <clears throat> preparing to training. Um, and we, what we do a lot is a lot of video preparation for meetings, preparing the training session. Yesterday was the day off, but I had an med- individual meeting with, with David, uh, with Baldi, with Pechile, with Simon, with Pat Metcalf. Uh, with Rusty, with Ali. So I took that day off to meet individually uh, with some players. Um, so the, the day always becomes full until you get to training. Then inside that day, after lunch, it's the time where I... De- the lunch is around 3 o'clock. After lunch, I would say it's the time where I relax a little bit or go to, or go to the gym for about an hour. Um, read, watch a show, and then a few hours before training, we meet again in, the, in the, the staff lounge and we go through the last details of training to get in the bus, go to training. Um, after training, the, the, the team meal and then the process of trying to, to go back to your room and, and, and go to bed. I haven't went outside once. I didn't know there was a beach here. Uh, I hadn't seen that sand yet. So it's, uh, I'm thinking I have to go out eventually get some vitamin D, but I, I haven't. I haven't. I, I've been inside all the, the way. Yeah, Peter said that it, it can be quite lonely. And he said just now it's okay, but once you're three, four weeks into this, if you're in for the whole tournament, he said it's really going to be testing for, for people because I guess it does kind of feel, it feels a safe atmosphere, but it all, I guess it also feels like it's kind of not in a prison as such, but you, you've got a lot of what you just take for granted not there anymore. I Look, I went to, when I coached San Francisco team, I went twice to participate in... Uh, doing training session with uh, with inmates in St. Quentin. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was an incredible experience, but I have a very good... I understood there what prison is. Mm-hmm. They, they, they come out one hour to the yard, and then they stay 23 hours inside, locked, alone. So for me to use the word prison is so not right, I feel. People said it before. Um, this is like a prison. It's so selfish and it's because you don't know what prison is. And I don't like to use that word, mm. uh, but I, I, I use the word. It's, it's weird. I, I can't touch people. And I'm very, this is very part in my blood. I'm a, there's this Latin side that comes from my mom and dad and we hug each other and I like to see friends and I have to say, tell, I, I avoid seeing people downstairs. I don't want to see people that I know so much from the, the, the soccer world. I had to apologize to, to people saying, hey, I'm sorry, I can't even shake your hand. And, and they go, no, we understand. We're all in the same boat. So living a life like that, that's weird. I agree with Peter that it could get lonely. Um, our, our staff is really good because we like to be with each other, uh, starting with the coaching staff, Axel, the media people, um, everybody, the medical staff. 
we like to be with each other. So I think it's important in a moment like that, that you have a club with good people because it, it, it's easier to pass the time. Um, we have conversations of all kinds. We have conversations at night on politics, on movies, on religion, because you like to be with people. Uh, it would be harder if you're in a group where you can't stand each other. Yeah. And then, then it makes it, it makes it longer. But uh, what I've noticed is players are in their 20s in average, right? You say a soccer team is between t- that bracket between 20 and 30 years old. And with time, it develops some tension to stay inside, not seeing friends, not not being allowed to go out, not seeing the girlfriend uh, or the colorful friend, whatever you want to call, wife, kids. And then it develops tension that what I felt is in training, sometimes that tension is there because that's the day-to-day. And I think it's going to become more and more uh, with games, with a player starting, others not starting, with frustrations, with the fact you're inside and communicating and talking with coaches that have been here longer than us, that's the feedback. You know, we have in training, we're always playing against each other. We know each other. There's not that Saturday game to break the routine. It's, uh, it, it's becoming long, that process. So we've, we've seen some more aggressive tackles that have to come down. We've seen some outbursts sometimes. And I understand that because it's really the stage where we are. Nothing that will happen here will give me a real evaluation. Nothing. Because it's not a real world we're living here in this tournament. It's not the reality of, of football. At the end, what we might say is, hey, this young player showed well. Our team showed um, a, a good mentality, a good character in this moment. Yeah, we, you're going to have that type of evaluation. But always behind your head has to be, but it wasn't a real setup in the sense it's not a reality of a league. It's, it's, it's weird. Uh, it's weird to be here. Yeah, I, I mean... Everyone, all the players, all the coaches that have done calls so far that I've been on, they've all talked that they feel safe, everything feels secure, et cetera, et cetera. But then yesterday you've got Sporting Kansas City have a positive test, which I'd read this morning and there doesn't seem to be any updates on that. But when you hear something like that, does that then kind of send some kind of shockwaves or anxiety through the group? Uh I don't know with the players yet. We didn't have that conversation. No players came to me talking about the situation of Sporting Kansas City or asking questions about it. Uh, we we do feel safe, but we just have to keep being careful with everything yeah. we do. Because, uh, you know, we're still going to make hear of the positive case. You, It's safe, but you cannot control everything. You You just need a cleaning lady in one moment to touch something and then you're you have a little percentage of chance of touching i don't know an apple even or a bottle of water it's tough to say yes it's protected yes we're in a bubble yes we see we feel safe but to say that it's impossible that nothing comes in no it's it would be very irresponsible to say that the weather so far, the, I, I've watched all the games. The, the games that's been starting at 8 o'clock, I have to st- still try and work out the times. The ones that are starting at 8 o'clock there, the players, they just look drenched after like five minutes. It just looks awful. Totally, totally, totally. Uh, that's why I, you know, how real is it, the evaluation of everything here? That's, that's my point. Uh, it's it's hard. And yesterday you saw with the Seattle uh, and San Jose game, mm. a lot of cramps, guys coming out injured. Uh, it was the risk to take. Teams are not prepared to play. We are playing, but we are playing with the, 
or emotional side or uh, going uh, to dig inside the tank everything we have um, or our personality and character side and our competitive side but to say that teams are ready to play at a high level no we're there no team it's not true you cannot say that um, you know you're, you're you're having teams like Seattle that Yesterday was their first game, and it's going to be similar to us or San Jose, that you go from almost now five months that your first game is a competitive game for three points. You go all in. No exhibition games in between. Not allowed to, to do a lot of things between each other. It just started maybe a month ago. So you, it is a challenge then to go without warming up your car and you go straight into the race. It's a little bit that. So that's going to bring injuries and fatigue and games that become open and more scoring opportunities, more mistakes, more lack of concentration. That's going to be all there. I'd asked you a couple of weeks ago about what the thunderstorm situation was. So I, I was on a call with Matt Beasler yesterday, and he he mentioned that a couple of days ago there was a meeting with the, the competitive committee and that if a game gets to 60 minutes and then after that it, there's a thunderstorm, the result stands. Yes. Does, if you know then the, that there's a thunderstorm in the area, is that going to affect how you might go for the game? You might go all out right from the start to try and get an early goal. But then if that we happens had, and then the storm doesn't come. Yeah. Yeah. We had that conversation between the staff and we said, we have to be the team that's up in the first 60 minutes. Yeah. That's our, ob our objective is to always be up in the first 60 minutes to always have the lead or not being down in the score or you're tied or you're up in the 60 minutes. And then we had that talk already between mm -hmm. the staff and, and very close, maybe two days, 48 hours before the game, we'll have again that talk uh, with the players. But I don't think that has to condition the way you play. You shouldn't be looking for a goal because you know that something could happen at minute 60 or you should go for the goal because of the way you play and the mentality of the team and the way you want to project your team. You want to go for the goal because of that and not because of a possible thunderstorm. So we want to start in the front foot and we want to start going at the opponent, creating chances and putting ourselves in a position to win. The way that you want the team to play, high press, like going for it, there's a danger, I guess, that especially in the first game, the guys you touched up in that training, they're going to be so fired up that they just they run themselves out maybe early on. I guess that's the message you're going to be getting across them as well. Just watch what you do. No, it's going to be a lot of, yes, yes, we want to be aggressive, but we right now we're evaluating of when do we want to be aggressive, how, with who, what moments. So you might see pockets of the game where we're, we're high and we're putting pressure on the opponent and you're going to see other pockets that we don't want to get stretched, open up. What we, we say a lot is first we set and then we press. So for us to start our pressing moment, we have to be set first. Uh, and, and for that, there's, there might be pockets in the game that we look set for a good amount of time so we manage our energy to become aggressive again. Um, so, so that part, because of the humidity that we felt a lot, and in training we feel it's harder to do that type of game. There's no doubt it's harder. You said on the call yesterday your dream result from Seattle-San Jose was going to be a draw, so you got that. What, mm -hmm. what did you make of the game? It was, a, it was an interesting one. I thought watching it from here, the aggression that you touched on was like incredible. We haven't seen that in one of the games so far, but just in general, it seemed like, although there was no goals, it was a lot, it was more intense than a lot of the other games have been. You know, when you play San Jose, you play a team that is clearly a men marking team all over the field. And, uh, 
Matthias was like that with Chivas, mm -hmm. and he brought it to San Jose, and he's very, he's a big believer in what he does. Um, you can agree or not, but I think it's very honorable the way he sticks to it, and I respect that a lot from him. Um, and that brings an intensity to the game. Uh, that brings a lot of chaos. That brings an open game because all your players are, bring, are being men marked individually. Uh, so you have to be careful how you play those short passes that right away could be stolen uh, and right away put San Jose in a, in a good position. But then the important against a team like that is how much do, can they take you away from your own identity? Because it's so chaotic that if you fall in that chaos as a team, then you, you, you don't find anymore your, um, your repair. I don't know how to say it in English. Your, 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 your references. You don't find your references anymore because you're playing a team that does the total opposite from you. We're, we're a team that plays zonal marking. Uh, Seattle has similar things in their defensive shape. But then you play against a team that defensively they play men mark total opposite. So then you don't want to find yourself um, in a position where it becomes chaos and then you lose your references. So I think yesterday's game had a little bit of that, had a little bit of that chaos. So that brings a lot of the intensity into the game. There's a lot of 1v1 situation. You have to get away from the 1v1 sit situation. You have to break the first line of pressure and then play in behind them. And that stretches the game. And that's what happened yesterday. Uh, a lot of high speed running from the players. Um, that's maybe what brought some injuries and cramps because players right now at this stage are not ready to do those amount of high speed running. Um, so, so that was my thought about, uh, about the game. And some players from Seattle that have shown in history that they could be key and big difference makers in MLS take a little bit of time to get going, you know, by their profile. So maybe they're, they're not, no, they're like San Jose and like everyone, they, nobody's at their, at their peak right now. I jumped on the the call with Matthias after the, the match and I asked him how he felt going into this game on Wednesday. Did he feel that they had an advantage because they've experienced the conditions or would you guys have the advantage because, because you were fresher? And he said he didn't really know. He thinks it's still an even thing. Do you feel that is an advantage, though, for them with their players now having experienced that? He seemed to indicate he might use his squad a bit more in this next match. But, I mean, you guys are going in fresh in one regard. I, I really think that... Uh, I really, really think that it's an advantage to, to have played a game. I thought uh, so too, yeah. Because when you are f almost five months without playing a different opponent than your teammates in training without feeling a reality of a game. What's going to be key is our first 30 minutes because our first 30 minutes might mean a lot for us in that game. There's a team that is already played a game, already got that off of their back, uh, already felt the day, the day game and, and referees and linesmen and everything. And there's a team that is getting back at it. So I, I don't think it's going to make a difference for the full 90 minutes, but it is an advantage for the first 30 minutes. That's how I would put it. Just got last couple of things. I, I'm not going to ask you again about the striker situation because you've been asked about that a lot and you, you've talked a lot about it. But no, you could, I'm okay with that. Uh, well, I, I, I was, talk about it every day. I know, I guess. I mean... When did you know that they weren't going to be coming? I mean, have you had a lot of time to prepare for everything that you were doing? No. No. no not no, even no. at training you couldn't prepare? Like before no. you left? Right. No. I, I, had, 
uh, I started preparing what we would do when we arrived there. Right. So I couldn't prepare in Vancouver. The reason was there was still question marks. It, it was very clear with the Freddie on Freddie's side that I knew maybe three weeks ago. It was it was clear that I knew the because Freddie was sharing a lot of personal things from me and to me and I respect him a lot and I respect the decision. So I had an idea about Freddie with with Kava and Toss. No, the, the talks were especially with Kava, the talks were were daily and it was him I was feeling and him having doubts of going and we were talking a lot about it. I never put a pressure on him. Uh, in training I used them more um, in both teams, you know, sometimes sometimes with the starting lineup, sometimes with the other side, because it was still a doubt. We were preparing everything all the time in a 4-4-2, the same way we've built the, the, the team for this season, using um, Toss with Cav or Reina with Cav and so on. Um, then when maybe... You know, very little before we left, it was confirmed that, okay, Kava's not going to be in. So we went back into the 4-3-3 with Toss Ricketts, and we started working on some dynamics with it. Um, and then 48 hours before the trip, 48 hours, our doctors uh, let us know about Toss. So then... You said, "Look, uh, let's not let's not touch the fourth situation. We'll work with our solutions when we get there." So now it's it's not a, a secret that it's a uh, it's big pieces for us because mm -hmm. what what you guys don't see it's the day to day locker room and and leadership side. You know, Kava, Toss, Andy Rose, they bring that kind of older vibe and experience that is needed. And we're a really young team. Yesterday I was calculating our starting lineup um, against San Jose might average 22 something, 23 years old. Wow. In the, in the bench, you see very young players. And, and when you see, talk about Pat Metcalf, Simon Coline, Damiano Pecile, Michael Baldissimo, a Theo Bear, you, 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 you see a young, even uh, the options of center back, uh, Derek, 21, Ranko, 20, Kimidi, 22, 21. And it, so you need these, it, these players to, to hold the rest together by their age, by their experience. So it, that was hard. But once uh, there was a moment that there was so many doubts and back and forth that I told my staff, guys, let's get on the plane. We evaluate then who's in the plane and then we start working our first game in Orlando. And that's what we, we started to do. I was going to ask about the leadership because obviously there isn't a lot of the older guys there. But at the same time as well, squad depth. You've talked before when we chatted about you don't necessarily you need to use a lot of players in a tournament format to, to do well. Do you feel you've got the depth now, though? And by depth, I, I don't mean in terms of quality, but just in players that you feel you can really, really rely on to go deep in this tournament without running some of these guys into the ground, especially maybe at like centre-back position. With, uh, with uh, the five players that didn't travel, if they're 100% it affected the quality of the depth. That's There's no doubt that that was affected. Um, I think what, what we have in our depth is very young players with energy. But to answer you how far it could take us, we'll see. It, what I believe, there could be some surprises in this tournament. There could be some players that are revealed, players that people don't know very well. People don't know very well uh, Leo Ousso. People don't know it very well Genio Bikel or Christian Dajome or David Milinkovic. And they don't know very well, well Ryan Raposo, Ranko. A kid like Guti also. 
so, so there's 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 these players that are still a question mark in the league, or who are they? That I think they're going to reveal themselves in this tournament. Um, for us to go far, though, we're going to have to run them to the ground. Yeah. If we want to have a chance to go far, we're going to have to run a lot of them to the ground. Yeah, I was expecting that was probably what you were you were going to say. I, I've got two last things to to ask you. First thing, we talked yesterday about the, this early morning game. So you, you're going from the extremes, 9 a.m. start, 10.30 p.m. When was the last time you coached a game at either of those times? Or have you ever coached a game at 9 a.m.? I did. 9 a.m., uh, it was 9.30 kickoff when I coached a youth team of Palmeiras. Last time that I coached in the morning was 2012. So it's not, not okay. too, too different. I mean, it's going to be weird for you, I guess, as well. Like when, I, when I spoke to Peter, as I said at the start, he said he's getting up at 4.45 in the morning to get everything ready to get the guys out early for that session. I mean, if you're having to maybe make a switch like that, how do you, I know I asked you this just a bit, in three days, how on earth can your body get used to that? No, our first day is going to be impossible because we we also going to have to wake up around 5, 5 a.m. But yeah. what I want is, I told my staff, we have, it's, we have to have the recovery in our head. I don't want us to arrive in training. The staff brings the energy to the session. You can arrive to the training uh, dead. So me, I'm more of preparing the night before. I'm more making sure that we wake up as late as we can. And for that to happen and to have, because I really believe in sleep in the recovery process, the only way it happens is that you let everything ready the night before. If you don't have, if you don't want to have everything ready the night before, so you'll probably have to wake up really early. Mm. So our staff is going to have, um, we decided to do all the work the night before for that session that's going to be in the morning um, and have all the game prepared the night, the night before. So we allow the players and the staff to stay in bed as much as they can and not go from living a life of waking up at 10 a.m. and going to bed at 2 a.m. From now, you're waking up at 5 a.m. and you're going to, to, to bed, I don't know, at, uh, at 9. Uh, it's, yeah. it's a big change. Yeah, I, I know me personally. I'm not a morning person just in general, but... I, I don't think I could get used to that in such a short period of time. The, the last thing, and if you don't want to answer this, it's fine because I don't want to get you fined because I know how touchy they are and stuff. So, but we, we've talked before about what the TV broadcast might look like. What have you made of the, the production so far? Because I, I'm hating the big Adidas in the center circle. It's just driving me absolutely nuts. It's uh, no, I don't think it's. I I'm, I get fine if I if I say that I'm gonna be honest. If I say that I don't like it either, I don't like the Adidas in the middle. But it's nothing against Adidas. Yeah, Adidas is their main <laughs> sponsor. I only wear Adidas. I love Adidas material. I love everything about Adidas. And uh, even before being in MLS, I, I bought Adidas. So it's, a, it's the brand that I like the most in soccer and sports. I wear Copa Mundials almost all my life. Um, but it, it doesn't change the fact that I don't like the Adidas logo in the middle for the game. Uh, for the rest, I think they've done a really good job hmm. to put this together in, in so, such a short amount of time. We're tested every two days. I, I, I still think, how can you have all the team organized by floors, all the meal rooms, this, all the training sessions, the details with water, with the bus, how can they put that together in two months? It, it is impressive. How, how the, they did the best they can. MLS did the best they can with ESPN to have the setup. Uh, for the games and broadcasting. So I think it's a really good job there. 
No, the only thing I would say that I don't like, it's what you said. I don't like the the, the logo, but uh, in the middle, but if you would take that out, I think it's it's very good inside the reality that is given to us. It, it, it's very hard to do better than what they did. Interestingly, I saw the UK stream and they they don't have that in the middle of the pitch. It's only over in North America that we have it. So if they wanted, they could easily get rid of it. Yeah, but it's uh, it's also a major supporter of, uh, yeah, of MLS. I know. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today, Mark. I know you're doing a lot of these and it must get a bit boring just staring at computer screens, but it's nice to see you face-to-face again on a, yeah, one of our well, talks. So.